Okay, our next speaker is uh, Nicole Barber, and she's talking about spatial and temporal variability in a biological gill on the Monterey Bay Sandy Continental Shelf during the 2015-16 El Nino. away from sea stars and we're going to go to the sandy continental shelf. So this is a part of a project that I was doing at CSUMB. It's finishing up my undergraduate capstone work. Uh, so disturbance. Uh, disturbance is a well-known process in ecology and it is um, it opens up habitat for destruction of biomass. Uh, when observed over time, it can be used to quantify geological and biological changes to a system. Uh, this is well evidenced in uh, familiar and well studied systems such as forests, which are periodically burned by fire, and also, of course, the rocky or tidal, which we've had a good introduction to, and, um, and that's with the pounding of storm wave and wave action. And then we also have, of course, the kelp forest which is controlled by the grazing of herbivores and sea urchins, as we've also been talking about. Uh, so the sandy conical shelf. The sandy shelf is an understudied area in marine ecology, and in the past it's been characterized as unchanging and homogeneous. Uh, despite this, it is actually exposed to a variety of disturbances, including uh, wave action, storms, anthropogenic activities, and tidal movement. Uh, in California, the continental shelf is narrow, and over 80% of it is covered in sand. Uh, it is also important for uh, ecological and economical reasons. So uh, along with having a lot of recreational and fisheries activity, it has important species like sea otters and um, rockfish, and of course market square that are used. So the geological structure of the sandy shelf uh, is best evidenced and shown with bed forms or sand ripples. So these sand ripples add vertical complexity to the benthic communities. And uh, as you can see here on the figure on the right, which I so expertly drew, oops. Um, so rippled scour depressions are bed form types that are classified as being greater than 0.5 meters across. And they're characterized by coarse sediment and uh, are maintained over time by currents. On the outside of these RSD depressions are smaller bed form types and some familiar benthic communities, including uh, echinoderms, polychaetes, and arthropods, uh, which often inhabit or live on the surface of the sediment. And as you can see here with our sea urchins on the bottom, or sand dollars, I'm sorry, <laughs> close. But our sand dollars over here on the bottom right, they often form beds of individuals as well. So as we've just been talking about, the 2015-2016 El Nino was very strong and brought an onslaught of storms to the California coastline. So this instigated my research question, mainly how this disturbance was affecting the biological and geological structure of the Monterey Bay shelf. Sorry, I'm not used to talking to a microphone, so I hope I'm not scaring you guys. Um, <laughs> so predictions. Um, my first prediction was that there would be changes to both the biological and the physical structure. And this was in, I expected to see this in the bed form type, as well as the distribution and abundance of burrowing communities in the shelf environment. I also expect that there would be that areas with different wave exposure or different overall aspect uh, would be affected differently in their physical and biological structure over time. So I expected that areas that were less exposed would be experiencing fewer changes. And uh, I would also expect that areas that were more exposed would obviously experience more changes. So that brings me to our study sites and locations. So we're right here in Monterey Bay. And uh, this is the Sonic Sandy, Sandy, Southern Monterey Bay Sandy Conical Shelf. Goodness. <laughs> so up here on the top right is our most northern site. This is Fort Ord. And uh, Fort Ord was, we thought, to be characterized by high wave exposure and large sand ripples. As you can actually see by this sonar image, um, it's characterized by one very large rippled scour depression. Uh, and Del Monte is our kind of medium wave exposure site. This site was characterized by a mixture of large and small sand ripples, uh, greater than 0.5 and less than 0.5 meters across, meaning that had a mixture of RSD and smaller bed form types. And then finally, we have San Carlos, which you can see just by looking at it that its aspect is very different. 
Um, and this was characterized by low wave exposure and had no arcs and depressions. Uh, it only had small sand ripples. So our data collection spanned from September 2015 to January 2016, over two seasons, fall and winter. Uh, we paired our tow camera transects, which were composed of 250 to 500 meter transects, as I, again, so lovely drew up here. My dots are terrible. <laughs> and we have uh, GIS GPS points along that transect, about every 15 meters. And from each of those points, we extracted furrow count, bed form type, depth, and aspect. Um, and we paired this with acoustic surveys, which were done in partnership with the Seafloor Mapping Lab at California State University, Monterey Bay. And with this, we used specialized multi-beam sonar to distinguish between flat and RSD habitat. So it was more of a, a broad scale. So for the first part of the data analysis, um, we brought our tow camera images as free frames into a processing software called ImageJ. And from this, I was able to extract burrow count data as well as bed form type classification. And that ranged from zero to six, with zero being flat habitat and six being RSD habitat and all the smaller bed form types in between. And these two figures here on the right were composed in, whoops, I keep making these clickers. Uh, these two figures here on the right are, were composed in ArcMap, uh, and they're just illustrating uh, the burrow density between the two, two seasons uh, for all three of our sites. So you can actually see, just visually looking at this, the areas that are small and cold, so the blue areas, are low density, or zeros, and the higher, warmer spots are higher density. So you can see for our, our most northern and central site, for Del Monte and Fort Ward, that uh, the density drops pretty significantly almost to zero um, between the two seasons. Whereas for San Carlos, uh, there's not really too much change that you can see visually here. Uh, for the second part of our analysis, we brought the sonar images that I showed you that were collected into the geographic information system for RSD auto classification. And this is just showing you the raw images before they're auto classified of the three sites. So this gives you a nice visual perspective of what these depressions look like. And you see San Carlos has just got, it's got a little rocky stuff going on here, but other than that, nothing else going on. And finally, for the final part of the analysis, I fit the data to a logistic regression statistical model. I uh, used burrow presence and absence as a response, and I fit depth, aspect, bed form, site, and season, which were extracted from the tow camera transects we did um, as explanatory variables. So diving right into the RST classification analysis results. Uh, so again, we were able to classify zero or flat habitat, or anything that was non-RSD, and then RSD habitat. Uh, and burrows were not present within RSDs. Um, they're very dynamic, high wave action um, depressions. So, and as I also previously mentioned, San Carlos was characterized by having no RSDs, and Fort Ward just had that one large RSD maintained over, maintained over time. So we didn't see any change really between the two seasons uh, for those. But for Del Monte, which was characterized by a mixture of big and small RSDs, you can see with this figure here on the right, this was composed in ArcMap again, and this is illustrating the differences in RSD percent cover uh, between the seasons. So the areas that are in white here are areas that did not change between fall and winter. And the areas that are green are areas that were unique, RSDs that were unique to the fall season. And peak areas are unique to the winter season. So you can see that we had a seasonal difference uh, with larger unchanging RSDs, white RSDs, surrounded by smaller fluctuating RSDs that with in the wintertime, you saw a lot of these smaller ones just popping up after or during the storm disturbance. Uh, so for bed form type, again, I had six different uh, categories here. So zero being flat and six being greater than uh, half a meter across or RSD habitat. And this figure on the right here is illustrating the bed form type variable with each of those classes with bed form type on the x-axis and the count of each of those classes on the y-axis. Now what these two numbers mean and the colors as well is the red bars are illustrating borough absence, so zero, and then uh, the blue bars or the ones are representing borough presence. Uh, so for the statistical model that I fit, found that bed form type zero, one, and four were all significant predictors of borough presence and absence. And uh, we also found that there was a higher likelihood of having burrows present at a smaller bed form type than at a larger bed form type. But as you can actually sort of see in this figure here, we were also less likely to have burrows present in flat habitat. Um, and they were actually at a higher occurrence in areas that had at least small sand ripples, which is kind of interesting. So moving into site location, again, I had those three sites. 
um, ranging from low weight exposure to high weight exposure, and that's here on this graph on the right. Again, uh, we cite on the x-axis and the count within each of those categories on the y-axis and split between borough presence and absence. And all sites were significant predictors of borough presence and absence. Uh, we thought there was a higher likelihood of having boroughs present at the San Carlos site, which was expected, than at the Del Monte or the Fort Ward site. And we also saw that Fort Ward had a higher um, count of abundances uh, than Fort Ward did, or Del Monte had a higher count than Fort Ward did. So for season, um, again, my seasons were representing the before El Nino and the during El Nino uh, periods. So uh, this figure here again on the right, illustrating season on the x-axis and the count within each of those categories for uh, borough absence and presence on the y-axis. And it was a significant predictor with uh, as expected, a higher likelihood of having boroughs present during the fall season than the winter season, which was kind of illustrated with that previous uh, GIS borough density graph. So what did our study find? Well, we were able to show that disturbance to the Sandy Shelf in the form of storms during El Nino caused quantifiable changes in both the biological and the geological structure um, over a period of just a couple months. And uh, we also saw a significant change in the abundances of burrowers on the shelf. Uh, and they seem to have a higher presence in areas of low wave exposure, having smaller bed form type, and a depth around 25 meters. Um, we also saw that, as expected, different areas of the sandy shelf were affected differently um, by storm disturbance in their geomorphology. So areas that were more protected saw less change, uh, and that was, again, going back to the site analysis and the borough density analysis of evidence there. And what does this mean? Well, I would argue that the Sandy Shelf is a great study system and should not be um, understudied at all in ecology. Um, it is not only prone to disturbance that is impacting its geological and biological structure on uh, observable time scales, but it also is really great for looking at the relationship between the biological and geological structure. Um, this sand is getting picked up and moved over really quick amounts of time and uh, causing some really interesting impacts to the shelf environment. Um, it is also critical habitat and vulnerable to change. So as we were previously talking about with climate change upcoming, um, we're expected to have higher frequency and higher magnitude El Nino events and storms. Um, so with that, we could see some pretty significant impacts to the structure of the Sandy Shelf over time. Um, as well as um, the shelf is used by important species such as uh, rockfish and sea otters that are known to forage and reproduce on this habitat. So now what? Long-term monitoring the sandy shelf. Obviously, I didn't get the after period. So what happened to the burrowers afterward? That's really important to really further illustrate the story is did they recover and how resilient are they? And what is the long-term structure of the shelf environment? Because we're seeing very uh, impactful short-term changes. Our study was also observational and restricted in the amount of taxonomic resolution we were able to get at. Um, so potentially in the future, we build a pair of dive surveys with our acoustic and uh, tow camera surveys in order to get at species richness. Um, as well as possibly incorporate predator and moving species. So uh, I previously had an interest in marine mammals, and so sea otters are using this environment for foraging as secondary, um, they, they feed on innkeeper worms as a secondary prey species. So it'd be really interesting to pair them and possibly the abundance and distribution of rockfish in this area with our data. And it is also unknown what initially forms RSTs. It is known they are maintained over time, but what initially is forming them uh, remains to be answered. So with that, I'll go on to C4 Mapping Lab at CSU and with their help. Dr. Michael Navarro, who was my mentor on the project. Dr. Corey Garza, who is the principal investigator of the Green Lance Mission Plans with Ecology Lab. You were up for funding this, and Dr. Alana Unfried uh, with statistical health. And I'll take any questions. Thank <laughs> you.